for another important class of relations that we use often, we have mappings or functions. Here, we'll be able to bring in our intuition for precalculus and calculus. We start, we'll have two non-empty sets, x and y. We'll form the Cartesian product, x cross y. So recall, this is the set of all ordered pairs, x comma y, where x is in x, y is in y. Then we have definition. So we'll say a mapping or function f from x to y, and we denote this as so, will be a subset f contained in the Cartesian product of x and y, such that to each x and x, we assign a unique y and y. The way we say this mathematically, if we have x comma y and x comma z as elements of f, then we must have that y is equal to z. Now, for notation, if we have x comma y as an element of f, we would say either f of x is equal to y, okay, so that's more familiar, or I could write f assigns x to y. Now, if we're in precalculus or calculus, okay, we've seen functions in there. The familiar way that we test for whether we have a function or not, we draw the graph and then we apply the vertical line test. So the idea is gonna be, if I have a function, then any vertical line will intersect our graph in at most one point. So for instance, here we have a function. If I take any vertical line, we cut in one point. Okay, we could cut no points, but then we have to fix the domain, what we're calling x. On the other hand, we took something like this. So this would be a function of y, but not a function of x. So this is x equal to y squared. Now you'll note if I take this vertical line at x equals one, we get two points. So here I have one one and one comma minus one. So you'll note here, we take x equal to one but we're gonna assign two points for y, one and minus one. So this condition here is gonna fail. Instead of visualizing our function as a graph on a set of perpendicular axes, we could also represent our function in the following ways. I could separate our axes apart. Okay, so this axis represents set x, this one represents set y. Then we'll just draw an arrow carrying our point x to y by f. And then I could put in other arrows for other points. A variation on this picture, instead of using axes, I'll just draw big circles representing our sets. And then this is convenient for when I want to show where subsets get carried to. So there'll be little islands inside of our circles. Now, more concrete examples. Let's let x be any set. I'll have f carrying x back to itself just by sending x to itself. So this is what we call the identity map. So in our picture, so x1 goes to x1, x2 goes to x2. Doesn't seem like there's a lot going on here, but this function makes for a great placeholder in our definitions. So we'll need this. Another function we could look at. Okay, so I'll have x still any set, non-empty. I'll pick some x1 in our set. f is gonna carry our set back to itself. Then I'm just gonna send every element to x1. So in our picture, x1 goes to x1, x2 goes to x1, x3 goes to x1. Everything gets carried to this single point. Now, for something a little bit more interesting. Okay, I could take, for instance, the integers for x, for y, I'll take the natural numbers, including zero. And then we could take familiar function like absolute value. So recall, what does absolute value do? Okay, if I take absolute value of n, well, if n is greater than or equal to zero, we do nothing. There's no sign on it, so we leave it alone. Otherwise, if n is less than zero, so n's a negative number, how do we remove the minus sign? We multiply by minus one. So this will return minus n. Now, main reason to bring up a function like this is just to recall that we have this business of piecewise defined functions. So our functions won't always be defined by some nice closed expression. Sometimes we may even have to go point by point. 
for the graph. Okay, well, this is something we know how to do from before. So we go over as much as we need to by our x coordinate and then up or down by our y coordinate. So we get a graph that looks something like this. Okay, note for absolute value, this definitely satisfies our vertical line test. So it's a function. Another important class of mappings are binary operations on a set X. Here, we'll assign to each ordered pair in the product of X with itself, another element of X. Okay, we'll denote this mapping by M for multiplication or product. We already know many examples of these. We could use addition of integers. Okay, so we just send j comma k to j plus k. We have multiplication of integers. So we send j comma k to j times k. And if I want to do division, we don't use integers. Instead, we go to the rationals. So we'll take the rationals, cross with the rational star, where star just means throw away zero. So the idea here, I don't want to divide by zero. So here we'll send q comma r to q divided by r. We'll say more about division by zero in a little bit. Now, while we're considering functions, where we're assigning points from a Cartesian product, we have some more distinguished examples. So one's gonna be the projection from Cartesian product of x cross y to x itself. So the idea here, we're just going to take each order pair, pick off the part that goes with x, so the first entry. Now if I want to visualize this, okay, we're going to do a variant on the pictures we had before. To visualize x cross y, okay, I'm going to need a plane. Okay, one axis for x, one for y. Then if I want to send this just to the set x, that's just going to be an axis. Now, I'll put it underneath because the way we're going to do this, I'm just going to take a look at where x is on the set x and then just send it straight down. Now, for convenience, okay, sometimes it's nicer to visualize this as just sending our point to the point x that's on the axis for the set x. So this gets everything on one picture. Likewise, we have the projection onto y. And for the picture here, instead of projecting straight down, we'll project to the axis for y, like this. Another variation, we can consider mappings where the sets have as their elements sets themselves. So for instance, if I take x to be any non-empty set, I'll have p of x, the power set of x. This is the set of all subsets of x. I'll fix an element y in x. We'll define i sub y as the mapping that carries the power set to the set 0, 1. So what i sub y will do, for each subset of x, we send it to either 0 or 1, goes to 0 if y is not an element of a, goes to 1 if y is an element of a. So this carries our power set to 0, 1. For a concrete example, let's consider x to be the set 1, 2. For the power set, we have four subsets. If I let our point be equal to okay, the singleton 2, i sub 2, okay, well, is 2 in the empty set? No, so we get 0. 2 in the set consisting only of 1? No, so we get a 0. 2 is in the set consisting of just 2, and in the set with 1 and 2. So these are both one. So that's how this I function works. We can in turn do a variant of that. Instead of using elements, we can just use other subsets. So I'll fix subset A. We'll have I sub A, again going from the power set to zero, one. Then here we just compare A and B. So we'll get a zero if A is not a subset of B, one if A is a subset of B. Perhaps the most important example, we have quotient maps. For these, we start with an equivalence relation R on X. So you may want to go back and review equivalence relations now. Recall, if I have an equivalence relation on X, 
we form equivalence classes. Then those equivalence classes form a partition of our set X. So the idea here, I'm just gonna take X and just chop it up into pieces. Those pieces are the equivalence classes. Now, for the set we use, we're gonna have Q equal to the set where the points are just the equivalence classes. Now, we'll form the quotient map. It's gonna go from our set X to the set of equivalence classes just by sending each X to its equivalence class. Note here, we have our relabeling rule, which says if Y is in the equivalence class for X, then the equivalence class for Y is equal to the equivalence class for X. Let's look at some examples. So if I use the relation where X is related to Y, if and only if X is equal to Y, we've seen that the equivalence classes are just gonna be singletons. So the equivalence class of X is X itself, okay, in braces. So, our set Q is just gonna be the set of these singleton subsets. So we're taking each element of X and just putting it in braces. Now note, if we took away all the braces, what would be left over would just be X itself. So Q is more or less X in this case. For the quotient map, okay, what are we gonna do? I'm gonna send each point X to its equivalence class, which is just that element X itself embraces. So note, we're essentially just sending X to itself. So our quotient map here is virtually the identity map. At the other extreme, we have the equivalence relation where X and Y are always related. Here, we have one equivalence class, the set X itself. So Q is gonna have a single point for the quotient map, we're just gonna send each element X to the set X. So for our picture, what Q does, it just sends every point to this single point, and we've seen that picture before. Now, for an example that's a little bit more concrete, let's take X to be the integers. We'll have X and Y are related, if and only if X minus Y is an even number. We saw here, there are two equivalence classes. So the equivalence class for zero is the evens. The equivalence class for one is the odds. So to be suggestive, I'll call these zero bar and one bar. We take a look at what Q is doing. Okay, it's gonna send minus one to one bar, zero to zero bar, one to one bar. You'll note here, what we're getting is the remainder upon division by two. Okay, so the remainder is always gonna be a number between zero and one minus the number you're dividing by. So here it's gonna be zero or one. Let's try this, but now we'll do, relation is X is related to Y, if X minus Y is divisible by three. So here the remainders will be zero, one, and two. All right, we have three equivalence classes, E0, E1, and E2. For E0, we just have the multiples of three. Okay, I'll call that zero bar. For E1, we'll have one plus any integer multiple of three. Okay, so we have these integers. And then for E2, two plus any integer multiple of three. Okay, then we note we get all integers back when we put these together. So partition. Now, again, we can take a look at what happens. So minus one goes to two bar, zero goes to zero bar, one goes to one bar, two goes to two bar. And again, we see we're sending each number to it's remainder upon division by three. Okay, so that's how it works in general. If we did X minus Y divisible by some positive integer N, again, we're just sending our integers to the remainders. For the last two examples, I'll leave it to you to show that we have equivalence relations. For the first example, we'll show that our projection maps from before are quotient maps. So we're going from X cross Y to X, saying the pair x comma y to the point x. The equivalence relation that we use will have that x comma y is related to z comma w if and only if x is equal to z. So I'll leave it to you to show that we have an equivalence relation here. 
we form the equivalence classes. So if I take the equivalence class for the point x comma y, we get all x comma w, where y ranges over all elements of y. Now, in the picture, that's just going to be the vertical line fixed at coordinate x. So for each equivalence class, we're just picking off the vertical lines. They're labeled by the x coordinate. So that means we essentially have a map going from each pair x comma y to the vertical line at x, which is labeled by x. So we're sending x comma y essentially to x. That's our quotient map. Another concrete example. Okay, this is going to be where the term quotient map comes from. Okay, so quotients meaning rational numbers. Our set's going to be the integers crossed with the integer star. Okay, so recall we're taking the integers and just throwing away zero. The relation that I use, one well, of the pair AB is related to CD, if and only if AD equals BC. Now the way you're supposed to think of this is that A divided by B is equal to C over D. So here we're just saying we have the same rational numbers. I'll leave it to you to show that this is an equivalence relation. For the equivalence classes, okay, if we take class for the pair AB, we should think of this as the rational number A divided by B. The points that are going to be in here are going to be C comma D where AD equals BC. But this is just saying take the rational number C over D where if we reduce or add the same factor into the numerator and denominator, we're just going to get the same rational number back. In here, there's going to be a distinguished element. Okay, that'll be A divided by B, where A and B have no common factors. So it'll be in reduced form. Another way to say that, greatest common divisor of A and B is equal to 1. For an example, okay, if I take equivalence class for the pair 1, 2, so that's supposed to represent 1 half. Okay, we have pairs like 1, 2, 2, 4, 3, 6, 20, 40, and so on. Now, the quotient map itself, what is it doing? It's just going to take each of these pairs, send them to their class. And then in this class, we have the distinguished element given by the reduced form. So that's how we construct the rational numbers from the integers. Now, while we're talking about rational numbers, let's explain why division by zero is a forbidden operation. So, if I try to fit one over zero or zero over zero into our definition from the previous board, okay, well, if one over zero is a rational number, okay, we say A over B with B not equal to zero. This is really an equation. Okay, so the equation one times B is equal to zero times A. So if we try to solve that, we wind up with b is equal to 0, contradicting our assumption on b. So this is undefined. We can't match 1 over 0 to any rational number defined on the previous board. For 0 over 0, the situation's a little bit different. So I'll have 0 over 0 equals a over b, b non-zero. Again, this translates into an equation. Okay, 0 times a equals 0 times b or zero is equal to zero. So that means any A and B work from the previous board. So if zero over zero is a rational number, it would have to be equal to every rational number. This is the case that we call indeterminate. Now, just to make sure everything's working, how about if I take zero over one? So. If I set that equal to A over B, with B not equal to zero on the previous board, what comes out? Okay, the equation here is zero times B is equal to A times one. So that just means A is equal to zero. So for the equivalence class of zero, one, which is representing the number zero, we have things like zero, one, zero, two, zero, three, and so on. So this makes perfectly good sense.